Today, here, folks, are all private citizens. They belong to reenactor regiments, or you might want to call them Living History Club. And ever since the bicentennial, I can't believe it was almost 50 years ago, the bicentennial, how did they actually function? So, what you're going to see here today on a small scale is that in action. And when the reenactors encourage. So as we begin the demonstration, we see coming out on the left, in some ways, and one of the drummers. At which point, Captain Barker shouted, fire back fellow soldiers for God's sake, fire. And that's the shot heard around the world. Now, what you see down the bottom of the hill here, folks, on the right-hand side are soldiers in green. These are German riflemen, what are called Jägers. The word is spelled J-A-G-E-R. There's an umlaut, dots over the A. The word Jäger in German means hunter. These soldiers were recruited from the forests of central Germany, in Hesse, Kassel, Hesse, Hanau, and some of the other states. They carry a short rifle called a Jäger rifle. Behind them are British light infantrymen. Light infantry were created during the French and Indian War after the first big opening battle, where a British army under General Sir Edward Braddock got chopped to pieces near what's now Pittsburgh. They were marching on Fort Duquesne. General Braddock had with him a 23-year-old Virginian. That was cowardly, savage warfare, and they would have no parts of it. Braddock's horse got chopped to pieces. Braddock himself wounded. He gave George Washington command of what was left of his force. But 900 British soldiers were killed in the battle. All the wounded were killed. And people who were in that battle never forgot it. The biggest 
problem the American army will have when it forms up in 1775 is discipline. In front of the American line here, the men who are firing are riflemen. They're carrying Pennsylvania long rifles. Many of them are from the frontiers, the mountains of Appalachian Hills. Ironically, it was from Germany and Switzerland that the rifles came to America by German and Swiss and they modified the rifles for American conditions. So the Jaegers firing their short Jaeger rifles, those are the forerunners of these longer Pennsylvania long rifles. The difference is the rifles have rifling down the barrel. It's grooves cut into the barrel. The British light infantry are carrying smooth bore muskets. That's what the usual European soldiers carried and what most of the Continental Army carried. The bullet in the rifles fits very, very tightly and has to uh, fly along the groove. And what happens is the rifling makes the ball shorter than the Pennsylvania long rifles. It can have an accuracy range up to 200 yards. So think of that as two football fields. The common smooth bore musket, soldiers typically don't fire till they're at least 80 yards away and quite often at 50 yards. So again, think of that as half of a football field. The Pennsylvania long rifles, the longer the barrel, the better the powder, and the skill of the marksman. Pennsylvania long rifles can hit people when you aim at them between two against regulars who are armed with smooth bore muskets and bayonets. The riflemen are gonna get clobbered, and they did. And the reason is very simple. Once the rifleman fires, it's going to take him a minute to a minute and a half to reload. You're getting hit with 69 caliber lead balls. They are round. The lead is a very soft, heavy metal. So when it hits something hard like a bone, it's like taking a ball of mud and throwing it against a wall. It's gonna flatten out. When you see movies where guys pretend to be shot and they sort of crumple to the ground, that's not gonna happen with a 69 caliber lead ball. You're gonna get picked up and thrown back through the air. It's nasty business. When there's artillery involved, these battalions often had very small battalion guns. You'll see some of them in camp, what were called grasshoppers. Sometimes they were only one pound cannonballs or two or three pound cannonballs. And people might look at them and say, well, it's just a small cannonball. It looks like a pool table. Cover, advance and fall back quickly, fight in open formation and closed formation. And in other words, they can do both. They can do what the militia does. They can also do what the regular does. The biggest difference is with the militia and the frontiersmen discipline. The riflemen that came to join Washington's army in 1775, the first unit of them was raised in Pennsylvania at Gettysburg's Tavern, it's now Gettysburg. They were mostly Scotch-Irish Presbyterian frontiersmen who hated the British and couldn't wait to get a shot at Redcoats. They go up to the army at Boston, and before you know it, the Museum of the American Revolution, you can actually see a little a vignette of this, where he literally had the grab of Massachusetts fishermen and a Pennsylvania frontiersman. Washington was a big man, six foot two, 209 pounds. Picked the two of them up by the, the collar to get them to stop fighting. In the European forces, discipline was unbelievably severe. If a British soldier looked a British officer in the eye, he could be flogged. If you gave that British officer attitude after he gave you an order, he could have you flogged. Flogging means you're going to get whipped with a cat of nine tails, anywhere from a hundred to a thousand lashes, depending on your offense. The Hessian regulars are on the right-hand side of the field. They are dressed in blue, and you see their flag, the Lion of Hesse Castle, that striped lion. There's a motto on that flag, Nesset Pericula, means no very brave. They copied the Prussians in their uniforms and in their tactics. And received the reputation of being extremely ferocious in battle. It was Hessians that Washington attacked Christmas Day, after, I should say the morning after Christmas. December of 1776, his famous crossing of the Delaware, Christmas night, in the middle of one of the worst storms ever. It started out as a cold rainstorm, to ice, to sleet, and then to snow.
and when his force hit Trenton, it was Hessian troops that they hit, and they defeated them in 15 minutes. After suffering months of defeat by British and Hessian troops, the Americans broke that spell. A total of about 35,000 German troops served in America, along with about 40 to 45,000 British troops. Now you see the Continental Line forming up on the left with one of its light field pieces in support. Actually, there's two or three light field pieces coming up in support. No, it's that simple. So what the Army did at Valley Forge, they formed two lines, 11,000 men, and they fired... Now coming up behind the British line, about to confront these Continentals who are very well drilled, it was at Valley Forge that the American Army received its first unified formal training under Baron de Steuben, also known as Baron von Steuben. Von Steuben was a Prussian army officer who was sent over by Benjamin Franklin and he became the Inspector General of the Continental Army. Von Steuben did not speak English, he spoke German and military French. So when he wrote the first U.S. Army drill manual in 1778 at Valley Forge, it was written in military French, translated by none other than Alexander Hamilton. And then it was taught to Washington's guards, who were pretty much all Virginians. They, in turn, taught it to the Army drill sergeants. And then on the Grand Parade ground in the middle of the Valley Forge camp, von Steuben himself would supervise the drilling of the Army. He shocked the men when he would actually take a musket into his own hands. A general was not supposed to do that and show the men how to do the drill. Not speaking English very well, he would curse at the men in German and French and occasionally in English, which the men found absolutely hysterical and they really developed affection for Baron von Steuben. But in order for the Continental Army to succeed and survive in the field, it had to get as good as the British Army. Nowhere in von Steuben's manual does it say, take cover behind trees or rocks and snipe. What you see the Continental troops doing there on the left is what was taught by, by von Steuben. For the British Army, the main weapon for the infantrymen on the battlefield was the bayonet. Young Lieutenant William Howe, Lord Augustus Howe's younger brother, who 103 dead. The American Army fought the British Army to a standstill. On average, you hear hunting horns, cavalry, hunting horns. So there's a lot of noise and a lot of racket. Would have been firing grape shot. Grape shot are small iron balls, about 20 of them in a charge. It looks like a bunch of grapes. And when they fire, it sprays like a shotgun shell. At close range, great shot can be extremely deadly. Now in the middle of the British line, you'll see soldiers wearing tall bearskin caps. Those are British grenadiers. We've got a beautiful sunny day here in Virginia on May the 6th. In London this morning, it was Cassidy. The 71st was 1,200. They had three full battalions of Gaelic-speaking Scottish Highlanders who preferred to use swords in battle rather than their muskets. When the Highlanders would charge at you with broadswords, it was absolutely terrifying. They had their own Highland war yells. and the British fired and they missed. But that was very typical in those days. At the Battle of Monmouth, Joseph Plum Martin tells of seeing Washington with artillery, uh, cannon shots landing all around them, and he says he didn't think. General Howe was exactly the same way. Uh, when you put the commanders in the field, they better look supremely confident or the men will lose confidence. There's a lot of psychological uh, appeal to it. <laughs> Or again, in a real battle, the firing typically didn't happen until you were at least 
80 to 50 yards apart. 50 was the typical thing. And even with well-trained soldiers, if you can get the men to charge at 50 yards, they can run into their opponents while their opponents are reloading and chase them off the field. That battle at, right after Valley Forge, the Battle of Monmouth, the Pennsylvania line stood in a, in a hedge with the British guards and grenadiers coming at them in a full bayonet charge. Anthony Wayne shouted at his men, pick the kingbirds, boys. They fired a volley and then charged at them through the smoke. The guards commander, Colonel Monckton, was killed. The guards flag was captured and the British attack was shattered. Anthony Wayne wrote to a friend in Philadelphia shortly after Monmouth to tell the Philadelphia ladies that the heavenly, sweet, pretty redcoats the distinguished gentlemen of the guards and grenadiers have humbled themselves on the plains of Mon. Most Americans have little idea just how long the American Revolution was. It was eight and a half years long, ladies and gentlemen. In that time, George Washington spent exactly two weeks home here at Mount Vernon. It was right after Yorktown, which is not too far from here. This was his favorite spot. This was his happy spot. And he spent the eight and a half years of the, uh, away uh, with the Army that whole time. It took that kind of commitment to secure our independence. We didn't win many battles in the Revolution, but the ones we won were so catastrophic for the British, and Yorktown was the final big battle of the war. Yorktown never would have happened without the French fleet and the French army. If you go into the mansion here at Mount Vernon, you will see in the hallway a little glass case that has a key inside it. The key is the key to the best skill. In July of 1777, a 19-year-old French nobleman, Marie Joseph Paul Rochive Gilbert de Motier, Marquis de Lafayette, we call him Lafayette for short, he came over to volunteer. He was personal friends with the King and Queen of France, who were equally young. They were only in their late teens, early 20s. If you read Washington's initial letters, he liked Lafayette, but he had no idea what to do. Congress made him a major general with no troops to command because he had never been in battle before. When you hear that term political correctness, it's nothing new. Lafayette was given that position because of his connections, not because of who he was in terms of military skill. However, he was so eager to prove himself. <laughs> We've got a handful of uh, British light bell, troops taking on the whole continental the line. Every so often in the midst of the horrors of war, something funny happens with truces. Battle of Germantown happened in October 1777. We almost won, but fog and confusion caused American troops to collide with each other, open fire.